Namaste, aloha. My name is Janapati Das. We are joining together on this most holy appearance day of Lord Varaha, the boring incarnation of Krishna. Uh, tomorrow is Lord Nishananda's appearance day, who is now non different than Lord Sri Balaram. And uh, so I have Balaram and Krishna in the back here. Please accept my most humble obeisances to you. And I like to uh, start by offering respects to you and offering respect to my spiritual master, Jagat Guru, Siddhaswar Upananda, Srila Prabhupada, and his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta, and beg for their mercy upon me to be able to offer this class to you to be able to speak as a representative. Um, although I am very unworthy of teaching and not very capable, I am praying for their shelter and their mercy. And so we are going to read some more from the Krishna book today. And uh, as of always, we will start with our hearing and repeating of Krishna's most holy names on this very wonderful day and tomorrow is a very holy and auspicious day of the appearance day of Lord Nityananda Prabhu who is the perfect guru. My spiritual master always said that he is the perfect teacher, the perfect guru and we can always approach Krishna easily by taking shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Nityananda Prabhu who is Shri Guru, <laughs> he's Guru Dev, he is the representative of the spiritual master and, and uh, he's a, he is, uh, the spiritual master is a representation of, of him, he is the original spiritual master and we can pray to Lord Nityananda for all uh, mercy and um, grace. So let's chant.
Fairy Bowl. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. A glory is to Lord Varaha. A glory is to Lord Nityananda Prabhu. All glory is to Srila Prabhupada. So, we are in the middle of a story in which five queens are married by Krishna. So we're going through the story of how these different queens were able to achieve Krishna as their husband or achieve um, to getting Krishna as their husband. So it's very wonderful. After hearing the statement of Lord Krishna, so we're reading about King Naj, Najnanit, Nagnanit, or Nagan, Nagnanit, Nagnajit, <laughs> like, you know, having a head cold. Nagnajit. So, sorry, I slaughtered that name. Nagnajit, of course, was a dear devotee of Krishna and done all the proper worship of Krishna, and um, Krishna was very pleased with him. So Nagnaji said, My dear Lord, you are the reservoir of all pleasure, all opulences, and all qualities. Can one, one can meditate on that. That's a very beautiful statement. You are the reservoir, right? So we have a reservoir, which, which the water will, you know, in a reservoir, our water will be gathering, a gathering place of all the water that oftentimes those places for that... Uh, cities will use for drinking right so what the reservoir of all pleasure the, the the reservoir of krishna's pleasure and opulences and qualities are is infinite it has no boundaries so when we say the reservoir and we talk about krishna things in reference to krishna we, it's we can only use the limitation of language which is unfortunately under the control of the material energy and and has a temporary sort of concept. But if we think about the reservoir of all pleasure, of all opulences and all qualities, now so all the opulences, you know, the, the strength, the, the wealth, the beauty, the, the renunciation, the intelligence, you know, all these things that are opulences of the six opulences of Krishna, um, human living entities sometimes will come into the world with some of them. You know, you could be a, a very strong person like a bodybuilder, you know, some, you know, a, a former Arnold Schwarzenegger. I know he's probably not that strong anymore, but he was like, you know, like this, hello, I am very strong. I'm Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? He's very, very big muscles, right? And then we had like, you know, beauty, very beautiful people. Sometimes uh, these models like Sophia Loren, who is I think dead now <laughs> he was like was just like so beautiful physically and you have like Donald Trump's or people who have a lot of wealth you know I guess nowadays it's not Donald Trump so much because um, maybe uh, Elon Musk they're, they're, they're predicting that he may be the first trillionaire I mean I, I can't even imagine that kind of money but <laughs> even billionaire is just like so much money uh, but you know they don't really have all the opulences and they don't have them in full even if you have a billion trillion quadrillion dollars it's not it's a limited amount of money we talk about this reservoir all opulence and infinite opulences said that that the uh, the that anantasesha who is balaram himself right balaram the great snake umbrella of lord vishnu has been praising with all his mouths, which there's so many mouths, uh, the opulences of Krishna, and they cannot, they cannot, he, he cannot complete, he's just continuously ongoing. This is a wonderful thing about, you know, spiritual life and spiritual qualities and, and the scriptures, they're continuously, endlessly, and infinitely revealing such beauty and such spiritual, uh, wonderful things to us that whereas you know some things that we find in the material world maybe a novel or maybe this music or this kind of uh, movie or whatever would be oh wow that's really great you know or this food 
And then after a while, you're like, oh, okay, that got kind of old. But, but you know, the Bhagavad Gita, the Srimad Bhagavatam, the hearing and chanting of Krishna's names, so just ever giving, ever continually um, uh, revealing new and fresh ideas. So this is similar here. That's because Krishna is a reservoir of all pleasure, of all opulences, and all qualities. And the hearing of Krishna's names is non-different. Krishna's names are non-different than Krishna. The, uh, the, um, the scripture of Krishna is non-different than Krishna. So therefore it is unlimited. The goddess of fortune, Lakshmiji, who always, always lives on your chest under these circumstances, who can be a better husband for my daughter? Both myself and my daughter have always prayed for this opportunity. You are the chief of the Yadu dynasty. You may kindly know that from the very beginning I have made a vow to marry my daughter to a suitable candidate, one who can come out victorious in the test I have devised. I have imposed this test just to understand the prowess and position of my intended son-in-law. You are Lord Krishna and you are the chief of all heroes. I am sure you shall be able to bring these seven bulls under control without any difficulty. Until now they have never been subdued by any prince. Anyone who has attempted to bring them under control has simply had his limbs broken. It's a very fitting analogy. You know, Krishna is what is possible for Krishna is oftentimes not possible for anybody at all. So this kind of idea of bulls or, you know, even your mind, nobody, no matter how renounced they are, can control the mind, you know, but Krishna is, with Krishna, all things are possible. King Nag Nagnanjit continued his request. Krishna, if you'll kindly bridle the seven bulls and bring them under control, then undoubtedly you will be selected as the desired husband of my daughter Satya. After hearing this statement, Krishna could understand that the king did not want to break his vow. Thus, in order to fulfill his desire, he tightened his belt and prepared to fight with the bulls. Krishna's always you know, it's just wonderful. Krishna is always there to uh, fulfill the desires of devotees. And here, deep down, the king Nag Nagnajit wanted him to marry his daughter and to fulfill his vow of this, this test of bridling the bulls. He immediately divided himself into seven Krishnas. So there we go. Krishna can do these things. Just like Krishna would, you know, divided himself uh, as cows and coward men and uh, sorry cows and the coward boys and all uh, the calves uh, to, f to fool Lord Brahma he was also able to do that uh, be with simultaneously with all the gopis and, the, and all at once and appearing as if they, they were the only ones with Krishna during the Rasa dance, and of course, of all the queens that Krishna married, something 16,000, we haven't gotten to that story of all the queens that he, he'll, he'll marry. He's still marrying queens, right? But he's able to be in each castle with 16,000, I guess, 108 queens at the same time. I mean, to do that, an ordinary man, that would be pretty impossible. I mean, I think you would, you would see your wife maybe once every 10 or 15 years or something. But Krishna was able to be with the queen and the queen would think, oh, I've henpecked Krishna. You know, he's to, spending his time with me. <laughs> so here he's also, you know, okay, I'll just take on these bowls and show my opulence and separate myself into seven Krishnas to take on these bowls. So he divided himself into seven Krishnas and each one of them immediately caught hold of the bowl and bridled its nose, thus bringing it under control as if it were a plaything. Krishna's dividing himself into seven is very significant. It was known to Satya, the daughter of King Nagnajit, that Krishna had already many, married many other wives and still she was attached to Krishna. In order to encourage her, he immediately expanded himself into seven. The purport is that Krishna is one, but he has unlimited forms of expansions. Yeah, that's why it's said that, you know, Krishna is the supreme source. What is that? Nichanam, Nichanash, Nichana, Nichanam, uh, Chetanash, Chetanam. I think I said that right, or maybe the other way around, which basically says that Krishna is one. Krishna is, when they say, oftentimes you hear this, 
God is one. God is one. So oftentimes it's, it's uh, people look at like Vaishnavism or Hinduism, I guess, in, in general, and they'll say, oh, it's a polytheistic religion. They have all these gods. But, you know, we make it very clear that the highest form of Vedic knowledge is that Krishna is one. Krishna is one in all of his expansions. He's able to expand because he's the supreme personality of God. And he can expand into many different forms and different, he has multifarious energies. This is not very a very difficult thing to understand because he's God. He's the supreme personality of Godhead. The source of all things, of all time, of all you know, all universes and all the spiritual world and everything. So, you know, in our little mind, we think, how can that be? How can that be? I can't expand myself into, into so many things. So why, why am I able to, why is it that Krishna can do this? I don't understand that. <laughs> I can't figure it out with my mind, right? So it's like, you know, the purport is that Krishna is one. It, but he has unlimited forms of expansions. He married hundreds and thousands of wives. But this does not mean that while he was with one wife, the others were bereft of his association. So that was his point. Krishna could associate with each and every wife by ex his expansions. Not only his wives, Krishna is able to relate to all living entities. How many living entities are in the, are in the material worlds? And we're talking about you know, just this planet alone. I mean, you go outside. <laughs> and you walk around in the grass. Those are all living entities. The bugs, the the, the mice, the birds, the, you know, all you go through a, through a rainforest and there's just hundreds and millions and billions and trillions of like living entities just on this planet alone. And that's not just humans. When humans, what, 8 billion people? That's just this planet. When we're gonna consider all the living beings that are in different dimensions, that are in bodies of fire and bodies of water on different planets that we can't see with our material science. Um, and then that's one universe with one, with just, you know, what, 12 dimensions. Let's consider all the universes that, that emanate from uh, Mahavishnu's pores, an infinite number of universes of complexity of millions and billions of dimensions. It's just like mind blowing. We can't even fathom that. But yet Krishna has a, a personal relationship with each and every living entity and follows them in the material world. And that's just the material world. Let's, let's cite that as the material world. Who's in the spiritual world? The spiritual world is even more living entities. You know, infinite numbers of living entities. It's said that the material world is just a small f a portion of, the, the, of everything. You know, is so you can't even, you can't even imagine that Krishna is relating to all these living entities, including you. And you're in this body thinking, oh, I'm so-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, and I'm born in this country, and you know, I'm this age, and I'm this religion, I'm, this is my job, and this is who I am. You're so, like, people are so in illusion about this, they, but they are trying to find happiness in the material world, and yet they've turned their back to Krishna. Krishna is still there. Krishna is still giving you what, you know, don't do that. Don't do that. Okay, I'll fulfill your desire. You want to, uh, <clears throat> you know, be a powerful person in this world and try to find happiness, or you want to have lots of sex. Okay, we'll fulfill that. But, you know, it just takes that continual uh, falling on your face and just having Maya Devi just pull you by your neck and beat you to realize, why is this like, not satisfying me? And then you die and you're like you have to be reborn and everything that you've achieved in this life you've forgotten you know so it's it's but yet Krishna is there Krishna is relating to you and it, it's so easy all you have to do is turn to Krishna and say you know my Lord dear Lord Nityananda dear Lord Chaitanya dear Sri Krishna uh, I'm tired of trip falling on my face and just be dragged through this material world and I'm so unhappy please let me let me come to you let me know who you are that's all it takes that's all it takes and then boom, you you find that the situation um, is pre presented to you if that's really what you want in your heart but a lot of people don't want that they that's they, even when they're just challenging about God they're like you know oh yeah where's God 
they don't want that. They'd rather just try to find it, their happiness in the material world and to say, oh, that, you know, God is not real and there's no proof of God and, you know, I don't have time for God. I mean, I've got all these things I want to do in my life. And just uh, that that is like kind of foolishness, really. Because <laughs> this, you know, this world is, is not our home. This world is not our home and it will not satisfy us in any way. And even if it did give us some kind of satisfaction, how long do we have that? 10, 20, 40, 50 years, even 80 years. You know, we live up, live up to 100 years old. How long is that, really? Not that long. And you find out real quick, once you start to hit middle age, everything starts to go, <laughs> starts to go. things are not as easy, your body hurts more, you're just like, you're looking back at you know young people and they're just like in that stage of where you were when you were in your teenage years and thinking oh this is great I have all my life and I you know I want to enjoy the material world but you're like oh that's what those people told me that's what those elders told me before and I was just thinking they're ignorant now you're in that position where the kids are just making fun of you and like oh these old people they don't know what they're talking about right so anyway kind of got off the point but krishna is there krishna is in our heart krishna is with us in this material world through the paramatma the expansion of the lord in the heart uh we can turn to him and we can seek uh and he is there as the representative of the paramatma is the the other expansion of Krishna is the, the pure devotee of Krishna, the spiritual master who is representing the Lord in the heart. So you can come to know why you're here, what's the purpose of your life. And you can have this relationship right now and just stop being on this samsara wheel of birth and death and come back to Krishna. Krishna could associate with each and every wife by his expansions. When Krishna brought the bulls under his control by bridling their noses, their strength and pride were immediately smashed. The name and fame which the bulls had attained was thus vanquished. When the bulls had been bridled by Krishna, he pulled them strongly, just as a child pulls a toy wooden bull. Upon seeing this advantage of Krishna, King Nagnanjit became very much astonished and immediately with great pleasure brought his daughter Satya before Krishna and handed her over to him. I think this is also a wonderful analogy because in, in, in a lot of ways, these bowls are kind of like your pride. You know, they say here the pride and the strength and that um, the pride, you know, how great I am, how great I am. And then you, you realize that when you surrender to Krishna, you're not that great actually. <laughs> You're very, you're very sinful and a low person, but Krishna loves you anyways. Krishna can lift you up out of this, this, these, this pride and this so you know how great I am. You know, people like are very, I could say, proud. They're very like they, they, they celebrate this idea of pride. Oh, I'm very proud of this. I'm very proud of being this way, or I'm very proud of being this way materially, or. You know this you know identify as this and so I have some I have pride and I go on a pride parade but actually that's why you know um, uh, that's why it's said in many scriptures that you know pride is not a good thing because it, it it puts us in an illusion of thinking that we're something that we're not and actually keeps us away from Krishna this relationship of love with God um, so Krishna, when we surrender to Krishna, he'll, he'll smash that pride. We don't feel proud. That's why Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu it said that one should chant the holy names of the Lord in a humble state of mind. Humility is, is the real uplifting. Being humble and understanding that we are not great. We are not better than other people. We should feel lower than the straw on the street and that our spiritual master or, or that Krishna will protect us from this this um, this this pride that we have of thinking we're we're something that we're not you know thinking that we are are great materially but you know that we're actually a lost spirit soul made, who made a very bad decision to be in this material world and we're being smashed t lifetime after lifetime 
by these bowls. We're being pulled pulled by our neck by these bowls of, of, of pride. And it's not for our best interest. It's not our best interest is to be with Krishna. And that is actually real strength. That is real strength is being protected by Krishna and understanding who we are. So devotees of Krishna, pure devotees, they are the true warriors. You, you look at them and you think, but they're so humble, but yet they're, they're so powerful and they do not, they're, they're like warriors. They're the real strong and they, they speak with authority and you can sense their, you know, Bhaktivedanta Prabhu, uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhu, he was, uh, I keep throwing in the problem. Anyway, he, uh, he was, you know, not a very tall statured man, but everybody knew when you walked into the room, he commanded respect and, and uh, was so strong, and such a fighter. My, my, my Guru Dev, same way, true Kasatri, a true warrior, um, but the most humble and a wonderful uh, person. Um, anyway, so he gave the queen. Then there was a marriage ceremony with great pomp. The queens of King Nagnajit also were very much pleased because their daughter Satya got Krishna as her husband. Since the king and queens were very pleased on this auspicious occasion, there was a celebration all over the city in honor of the marriage. Everywhere was heard the sounds of the conch shell and kettle drum and various other vibrations vibrations of music and songs. The learned Brahmanas began to shower their blessings upon the newly married couple. In jubilation, all the inhabitants of the city dressed themselves with colorful garments and ornaments. King Nagdajit was so pleased that he began to give a dowry to the daughter and the son-in-law as follows. First of all, he gave them 10,000 cows and 3,000 well-dressed young maidservants ornaments ornamented up to their necks. The system of dowry is still current in India, especially for Kshatriya princes. Also, when a Kshatriya prince is married, at least a dozen maidservants of similar age are given along with the bride. After giving the cows and maidservants, the kings, king also enriched the dowry by giving 9,000 elephants and 100 times more chariots than elephants. This means that he gave 900,000 chariots and he gave a hundred times more horses than chariots, or 90 million horses. Wow, that's a lot of horses. <laughs> and a hundred times more slaves than horses. Such slaves and maidservants were maintained by the royal princes and all provisions as if they were their own children or family members. After giving this dowry as described, the king of the Kashalya province bade his daughter and great son-in-law to be seated on a chariot. He allowed them to go to their home, guarded by a division of well-equipped soldiers. When they were traveling fast to their new home, his heart became enlivened with affection for them. Before this marriage of Satya with Krishna, there had been many competitive engagements with the bulls of King Nagnajit and many other princes of the Adu dynasty and of other dynasties as well had tried to win the hand of Satya. When the frustrated princes of the other dynasties heard that Krishna was successful in getting the hand of Satya by subduing the bulls, naturally they became envious. <laughs> of course, this is kind of a Kshatriya thing too. It's when, you know, when you're in the mode of passion like that, you're just like, I wanted that princess. And so it's natural for them to, okay, I'm gonna challenge them to a fight, right? While Krishna was traveling to Dwarka, all the frustrated and defeated princes encircled him and began to shower their arrows on the bridal party. When they attacked Krishna's party and threw arrows like incessant torrents of rain, Arjuna, the best friend of Krishna, took charge of the challenge and he alone drove them off very easily to please his great friend on Krishna on the occasion of his marriage. So here we go again. Krishna could uh, you know, easily take care of those because it was his... Uh, one of the reasons he came was to alleviate the burden of the Kshatriya race. And, but he oftentimes will give his devotee the, the service to, okay, you know, and Arjuna was like, I want to please Krishna, so I'll just take care of this. And Arjuna, of course, as we know, is, is, was an amazing warrior, probably the greatest warrior of all time. One of, if, you know, not as great as Krishna or Balaram, but 
definitely one of the greatest of the Vedic kingdom. He could be, he could, he would, in the Mahabharata, it was stories of him defeating even Lord Shiva, you know, great demigods, and Lord Indra, and, and, uh, and Gandharvas, and heavenly creatures, you know, that he could, he could defeat, you know, not to mention the fact that he was able to, to defeat in the Battle of Kurukshetra, great, great warriors like Bhishma Dev and Dronacharya and Kripacharya, as well as um, Duradhana. And so, uh, actually, that was done by Bhima, but you know, in in the same way, in the similar sense, he immediately took up his bow of the name Gandiva and chased away all the princes, exactly as a lion chase drives away all of their small animals simply by chasing them. Arjuna drove away all the princes without killing even one of them. So actually he just scared them off. <laughs> After this, the chief of the Yadu dynasty, Lord Krishna, along with his newly married wife and a huge dowry, entered the city of Dwarka with great pomp. Krishna then lived there with his wife very peacefully. Krishna had another aunt, his father's sister, whose name was Shruta Kirti, who was married and lived in the Kekaya province. She had a daughter whose name was Bhadra. Bhadra also wanted to marry Krishna and her brother handed her over to him unconditionally. Krishna also married her as his bona fide wife. Thereafter, Krishna married a daughter of the king of the Madras province and her name was Lakshman. Lakshmana had all good qualities and she was also forcefully married by Krishna who took her in the same way that Garuda snatched the jar of nectar from the hands of, men, of the demons. Krishna kidnapped this girl in the presence of many other princes in the assembly of her Svayambara. Svayambara is a ceremony in which the bride can select her own husband from an assembly of many princes. The description of Krishna's marriage with the five girls mentioned in the chapter is not sufficient. He had many uh, other thousands of wives besides them. The other thousands of wives were accepted by Krishna after killing one demon named Balmasura. All these thousands of girls were held captive in the palace of Balmasura, and Krishna released them and married them. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the second volume, third chapter of Krishna, Five Queens Married by Krishna. And... Ooh, this is actually... They're, they're setting up the next story, which is the deliverance of the demon Balmasura, and that I... I think probably because I talked a bit in this lecture, I'll just uh, finish it there and we'll leave this one for its own chapter because it's a really wonderful story. It's one also how Krishna was able to uh, save, you know, so many of these princesses who were being held captive by this demon and how he killed the demon. And, and so we'll, we'll leave that for the next time. And what we'll do now is just chant Krishna's names. We always do such wonderful, wonderful spiritual. I think what I can do is talk a little bit about Lord Varaha, since today is the appearance day. And Lord Varaha was the incarnation of Krishna, of Lord Vishnu. Uh, there's a lot of backstory to this story as well. And, and it also has to do with uh, Jaya and Vijaya who were um, gatekeepers of in Lord Narayan in the heavenly planets in, in Vaikuntha Lokas. And when the, um, the four brothers, Kamara brothers, who were great sages, and they're also the, they're also the it's funny because with Vedic stories, you keep coming, going backwards too, but they were actually sons of, of Lord Brahma. So when Lord Brahma created the universe, uh, he was, he had all these uh, progeny. He needed progenitors or people who would populate the universe with, with, you know, with people basically, spirit souls who wanted to stay in the material world. And, but the Kamara brothers were actually, um, pure devotees and they chose to stay in the form of small boys naked boys <laughs> and they were brahmins they were they were pure devotees because but they they also started out as impersonalists but they had heard they had heard the um they had heard about uh krishna 
through their spiritual master and um, were able to eventually become devotees of Krishna. Uh, but they actually came to go see Lord Narayan, who was an expansion of Krishna in the Vaikuntha Lokas. And when they got to the gate by Krishna's arrangement, the doorkeepers didn't recognize them and just saw them as kind of troublesome boys and told them they couldn't come in. Well, because of that, they were cursed by these by these four brothers. And but then they felt guilty about it because they were cursed to to go to the material world and act as demons. But then, of course, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, this story is relayed and how Lord Krishna, Lord Vishnu, came to them and explained, you know, Krishna likes to, he likes to fight. He likes to, he has to have his pastimes. So he has to have someone, devotees, and since all living entities are devotees of Krishna, someone has to play the part of uh, his enemies. So he was saying, well, you can serve me. You can serve me as, you know, as my my enemies and I will fight with you and kill you and and then you'll be reinstated in, in this in this uh, position as my doorkeepers and uh, so that's very wonderful so that point being saying is Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu were actually Vijaya and Jaya, and Jaya one of their, their incarnations so of course Hiranyaksha was the demon, he was a great demon with so much power, he would go around the universe trying to find someone to fight him, right? But there was a situation where uh, he he caused the earth planet to fly off and sink into, started in, in its Hiranya, uh, the Kajal Ocean, so the earth was sunk, and so Lord Krishna came out of the nose of Lord Brahma as Lord Varaha, the great boar incarnation, dove into the ocean to save the earth planet. But of course, at that time, uh, Hiranyaksha was trying to find someone to fight with. And because of that, he he went to all these demigods and eventually ended up with Varuna. The, but Varuna was old and he had, had kind of retired from fighting demons. And so he was mocking, you know, oh, old man, you want to fight with me? And, and so he was actually really insulting and Varuna got upset but said you know look if you want someone to challenge I'm just too old to fight you but you can fight Lord Vishnu and he's the one he's very capable of fighting you so he went off to find him and started insulting Lord Varaha and Varaha was basically bringing the earth planet to the surface of the causal ocean and letting it by his power just float on there and so then at that point, of course, he had this great fight with Hiranyaksha that was just, you know, an amazing. And it's also accounted in the story of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, of course, his brother, his brother became Hiranyakashipu, of course, was the father of Prahlad Maharaj. That's a whole other story. And then, of course, Krishna came as Lord and Sringadev. So there's wonderful, wonderful stories, and we're so celebrating to all glories to Lord Varaha for, for protecting his devotees and vanquishing the demons. And tomorrow we will be celebrating the incarnation, of course, of, of, of Lord Balaram in, in, um, as Lord Nichananda. And so I hope you have a wonderful couple of days, very auspicious. Today, of course, is a codice too so we're having very great fortune to be able to engage in spiritual activity and now we will chant Krishna's names
Okay, hi bowl. So I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful evening and a wonderful Lord Nichananda's appearance day tomorrow. And I don't forget, if you haven't already, make sure you hit that like, like button, subscribe button, share these videos with your friend and encourage them to subscribe to my channel. And we will see you next time. Namaste.